telling me that it's streaming live. Now. Okay, okay, yes, it is. All right. So it, my Facebook went crazy. All right. Good afternoon, Facebook land to the people of District 73 and beyond. Welcome to Front Porch Friday. Um, my name is Kim McCarthy, as you can see by my sign strategically placed behind my head. Um, I'm coming to you today from my front porch, obviously, in Sugar Creek Township, District 73. And as you can see, I have a special guest with me today, Michelle Novak, who is also running for state representative, but she's district, it's 53, is that right? Oh. Yes, uh, down in the Middletown area. I'll let her explain to you in a little bit exactly what her area covers. But um, I have her on here today because obviously the topic of the moment is our schools reopening next month. Um, there's a lot going on online. If you've been paying attention, all the school boards have been frantically trying to um, determine what kind of an opening is going to be best for not just the students, but the teachers and the families as well. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of opinions. And um, we're gonna come here today to, you know, we don't have the answers. I wanna put that out here now. I'm not an expert on um, pandemics or how to open schools safely, um, but I do care deeply about the issue. Schools are part of my platform, probably one of my three highest priorities for this campaign. And um, well, just when it comes to that, let me just talk about why I care about this. I really have three different perspectives or three different angles that I'm coming from. Firstly, I am a candidate for state representative and state representatives are responsible for education in this state. So I'm running for office, frankly, because I saw a representative in my district that was not caring about the condition our schools were being left in, the funding issues that have been going on for so long, and the struggles that uh, we face with failing levies and um, you know, issues that are impacting the experience of our children. So that's one of the reasons I'm running. So I have that perspective. Um, I'm also a mother that has, well, I did have three children. I now have two children left in the um, school district. My boys are going into 10th grade in the fall in Bellbrook. So I care about my children's health and I care about the teachers that are teaching them. And then the third angle I have on this is I am a community organizer and I have been for close to 10 years. So my role there, I see it as helping people understand what their passion is. And once they understand what that passion is, I help them organize around it so that they can make the changes that they need or they want to see in their communities so that their communities can reflect their values better. And that's why I've been meeting with teachers, um, speaking about this issue online so people can help, you know, organize themselves and really let the officials know what they need to do their jobs properly. So that's why I'm here. And um, yeah, I hope we can have a good conversation um, surrounding this. Um, I guess I, I do like to mention this when I talk about our schools going back. My employment, my place of employment, we have 28 employees where I work for an IT company in Dayton, 28 employees, which is similar to what a class size might be. And we are spread out over 5,000 square feet, <laughs> slightly bigger than a classroom. And at this point, well, since March, actually, we have had um a rotating schedule so basically we've all been working from home and we are not allowed to have more than 12 people at once in a 5,000 square foot space so i have to take that into consideration when i think about our children in these small rooms for hours on end um, we have to look after their safety as well as the teachers so with that let's welcome michelle hi michelle how are you Hi, I'm fine. Thanks for inviting me to join you today on your front porch. I'm actually on my back porch. Um, ah, so, I thought but... it might be your front porch, but you can't really tell, but good. Front, back, I know. we'll take it. I know. Yeah, no, my, my front porch is not as pretty, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got flowers. I've got signs. I mean, yeah. you know, 
<laughs> yeah. Well, let me just share a little. I'm just going to read from Michelle's uh, uh, website. Uh, Michelle is a transformation leader whose vision is to be a part to be part of a community where every person has access to a quality life. Her mission is to remove economic and educational barriers and provide safety and opportunities for the citizens of Butler County. So I like those values, very nice. Um, I do notice that you are a graduate twice from Wright State, which is in District 73 and another one of my passions. It's also under stress right now. Um, and I see that your mother was a public school teacher as well. So um, why don't I hand it off to you now, if you would like to tell us a little bit about yourself and um, why you are running for state rep. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, just briefly, um, I grew up in Miamisburg, graduated from Miamisburg High School, went to Wright State, uh, got my degree in finance, and then went on to get my uh, graduate degree in public administration. Um, I've mostly used my degree just to support my community in different ways. Um, I have four children and I um, stayed at home to raise them, um, joined the PTO, um, started a volleyball team. <laughs> just anyway, you know, when you have kids and when you have multiple children, you get involved in many different ways in your community. And so that's what most of my life was about. Um, I also am a grant writer and strategic planner for nonprofit organizations. I joined the school board a few years ago, about five years ago um, in Middletown. Um, I was motivated to join the school board because I knew that I had skills that I could bring to the office. Um, I was on the PTO, I was a PTO treasurer. I was connected to the teachers, I was connected to the parents. Um, I wanted my kids to get the best education possible and all the kids in Middletown. Um, and so I ran for office for the first time, um, was elected to the board and have really enjoyed that feeling like it was a great way that I could make an impact in my community. Um, what I started to see was that locally we kept running into obstacles and it was obstacles and hurdles that the state kept putting in front of us. So we'd make progress and then the state would do something and just seem to undermine that progress. And we would keep pushing with what we had and then the state would come and undermine that again. Um, so I got involved in a lot of statewide advocacy with education. I am a member of the Ohio School Board Association Diversity and Equity Committee. I'm also a member of the Urban Network with the Ohio School Board Association, where the largest urban districts in the state meet together and talk about issues that impact all of us. Um, some of those issues that have been reoccurring themes over the past five years have been the state report cards, the academic distress commissions, and um, school funding. Those three things just over and over again. Those are our main obstacles that we've been facing for five years now. So it's, it's nothing new right now, um, although it has escalated over the last year. Right, right. So we're pretty much running for the same reason, I guess, <laughs> uh, coming from different um, angles. But yeah, I mean, without education, without strong education, what does our state have in its future? You know, we have to prioritize it and it's just not happening. Um, yeah, so we have issues here in Bellbrook. We've had um, two levies fail. We've had to make major cuts. Um, what kind of impact have has Middletown schools seen over the last few years? I mean, you mentioned those three things, but yeah. has the pandemic kind of exasperated that? Yeah. Oh, well, I can't even imagine what you're going through in Bellbrook with uh, two failing levies. <laughs> um, I know that on our school board, um, we did have major financial issues five, six years ago. And um, the previous board really helped to get us back into the black. Um, and we've been doing well trying to avoid levies since. And um, about a year and a half ago, we weren't looking at any levies in Middletown. We were very fortunate. We were looking at innovation and what we could do to support our kids. Um, Although I have to say that with the previous funding formula from the state, we were still a capped district. And um, that means that they said that our kids should get a certain amount of funding. Um, 
but they were only giving us 70% of that. And one of the excuses was that they didn't want to give it to us all at once because the teachers unions might see that and want to capitalize on that in negotiations. <laughs> so that's what I heard coming into the school board. Um, but we remained a cap district up until last year in July when they redid the funding for schools and they moved us to a, um, actually it wasn't even a formula. It's no longer based on how many students you have in your district. It's just flat funding from the previous year for all school districts. So you could be a growing district, have more kids, and now you have the same amount of funding that you have to spread out amongst more children. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that wasn't all. Um, on top of that, um, they introduced the expansion of the Ed Choice Scholarships. And that impacted many school districts across the state. And with the way it was um, described or the way that it was being implemented last year, going into this year, we're looking at about 400 out of 615 school districts across the state that were gonna be impacted. Mm. Um, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and it wasn't that, um, and it wasn't necessarily a matter of school choice. It was a matter of how they were gonna get that funding um, the state was not providing it, so they were taking it out of the bottom line of every school district, every public school district in the state. Um, so on top of that flat funding and possibly growing districts, we in Middletown had a growing school district, even though um, we were flat funded. And, um, and then we had about $500,000 additional expenses that had to leave our district to go pay for private school vouchers. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, so, and then this year we were looking at another million dollars in cuts and every year it just goes up more and more. Um, initially we we're looking at about $14 million within five years that we would have to cut from our budget. And we were definitely looking at a levy. So we went from a year and a half ago, no levy to all of a sudden within three years, we would have to be running a levy in our district. So for Bellbrook, um, <laughs> You know, if, if you, I don't know if you were impacted by the initial um, Ed Choice voucher expansion. Um, you know, I'm not sure, honestly, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but um, I know, so you're on the finance committee of the school board, correct? Yeah. And you had mentioned um, what I thought was quite an innovative way you had handled that. You invited some members of the community to be part of a committee. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how, that, how does that work? So um, we meet quarterly and um, we didn't initially have a finance committee, but we thought it was important that we were transparent with the community, that the community saw what was happening. Because really, how could we anticipate or expect I mean, we weren't actually anticipating a levy when we started the committee, but um, we wanted the community to just know what was going on. So if anything came up, the community would be informed. Um, and so the school board members decide, the school board members got to uh, think about who we know in the community, the treasurer, um, other administrators. We just really wanted to invite um, anybody who was interested in coming and talking about school finance with us and that we could really teach this is what the school budget looks like. Um, this is how these different factors are impacting our school budget and give them an opportunity to give us feedback. Um, so it's not just five school board members that right. are trying to um, get the temperature of the community. We have right. an expanded group. Um, we're looking for people who are in business and banking, um, accounting, who, who really um, have seen budgets and spreadsheets before and, and could really speak to our finances. Right. Yeah, no, I, I like the sound of that. There's definitely been some issues in our community about the financing and not understanding and not being as transparent as it could be. Um, they've made great strides, I will admit, you know, over the last year with trying to pass these levies, but, um, you know, I'm an accountant myself. Um, I couldn't imagine being in charge of a um, multi-million dollar budget without having any kind of financial experience behind you. So I think inviting members of the public who have that experience um, kind of kills two birds with one stone, right? You get that financial experience plus you're 
inviting the community in to understand exactly what's going on. So good for exactly. you. Exactly. You get I like it. Because <laughs> even between the treasurer and I have a finance background, um, you know, more sets of eyes gives us more perspective. For sure. For sure. All right. Um, and then one more thing before we get on to the reopening. Um, I know you mentioned you have work sessions um, regularly, and that's something that our school board does not have. And for me, I just don't understand how they conduct business properly, not being able to sit together. And I see a lot of the, you know, the regular monthly meetings that they have. I see a lot of discussion going on there that to me, I think this is kind of work session type discussion that might be better off um, being held in a different format. So how, how do those work sessions work for you guys and what benefit does it give you? Um, well, let me first say that when I joined the school board, um, it was the first time I was in an elected office, but coming from that strategic planning, grant writing background, um, I always look at best practices. And the Ohio School Board Association provides a lot of those best practices for school board members, provides trainings. And so I went to as many trainings as I possibly could to find out how this whole thing works. Um, our communication does, is not limited to board meetings. Um, as a school board, you are continuously communicating with the administration, uh, primarily the superintendent and the treasurer. And a lot of business and conversations happen um, through uh, just phone calls um, with them just giving you a heads up. This is what's going on. So and so resigned. Now we're looking at this. And you have to have that communication between the board members and the administration. Now what you can't have is you can't have three or more board members um, in communications with each other at the same time about anything that's going to come up on your agenda. Our board member communications um, when we're in groups is limited to um, you know, scheduling a meeting. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just very limited. So, um, but at the same time, you have to have transparency with your community, and we have work sessions with our board, so that we can be transparent and bring up issues that we're planning on voting on in the future, and especially those big issues. Um, like we had to, like I said, we had to cut a million dollars from our budget this year. So that didn't just happen all of a sudden at a work session, but right. conversation started in December um, when we knew that Ed Choice was an, an issue for our district um, and you know our treasurer had run uh, the forecast. So um, we talked about transportation, we talked about everything. And you know it was about getting a pulse of the community that way that the board members could be advocates for the community. And, um, and then, before we made the cuts, two weeks before we made the cuts, we had a public session, our work session. We talked to, actually prior to that, we even had a finance meeting where we talked about the cuts with the finance meeting first. Sure. <laughs> so that was one pulse check for the community. The next was that public session, that work session where we talked about this is where we're gonna make the cuts. That gave the community a couple weeks to get back to us on feedback before we actually voted on it. Yeah, yeah. And there were some adjustments that were made in the meantime. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, um, I like that idea. I think anything that, any practice that shows good governance and um, accountability and transparency is um, a positive thing. And I think things like that would help us with um, explaining to the community why we need these levies and, you know, the difficult situation that the state likes to put us in <laughs> time and time again. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So um, again, I just want to say that, you know, Michelle and I don't have the answers to how we reopen schools safely, but um, we just want to have the discussion here so that we can um, hear all the different opinions out there, I guess. Um, so actually, I want to say, you know, any solution that is um, put together, we have to consider, you know, we've got special needs kids, we have children that don't have access to the internet, they don't have computers, they face different challenges in their family life. Um, any solution that is derived has to include them. Um, and whether that's on an individual basis, you know, there might be a solution that works for the majority of kids, but we have to remember 
those other children, the people on the, the outlying people um, in the equation. So um, I think that's a really important fact to, uh, to bring up. So, all right, so sitting on the school board, Michelle, what have you seen as the biggest challenges for getting your kids back into the classroom? And well, I guess I should ask, has Middletown released a plan yet or are you still trying to formulate that? We released a plan, but okay. it's open to change every week, depending on information that we get. Um, we have to have a plan. I think all school districts have to have a plan because we can't just move on a dime. Like we have to be training people for what that plan's going to be. We have to be hiring people for what that plan's gonna be. All of those things take time. So we were hoping to hear from Governor DeWine in March on how we were planning to reopen in the fall. And we didn't hear from him in March, April, May, June, we were still waiting. And so we just got information about it. But in the meantime, all the school districts, uh, I mean, we had to come up with something because you have to plan for the future. <laughs> right. um, so, so we tried to be as, um, have as many options as possible. Um, we're thinking about student safety and we're thinking about teacher safety because um, they're the adults and they're the ones that are more at risk. Um, that's what we're hearing from the health officials is that they're more at risk for coronavirus. But also we have to consider that if the children get it in school, um, you know, someone's family has it in their household, the child brings it to school, gives it to another child, it goes to someone else's house, household. I mean, there's a lot of complexities to it. So we're hoping to, and we have been really relying on health officials to help us to um, put those plans together. My superintendent likes to say that, you know, he is really good at math. <laughs> He's really <laughs> yeah. good at data and education, but um, these, uh, public health protocols are not his specialty. <laughs> so we rely on the people um, who do have that specialty. <laughs> sure, sure. So um, do you have different options then, you know, depending on what it looks like when school goes back? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I yeah. mean, for families, we have, um, we have a completely virtual option. Um, and we also have a full-time in-school option. Although I know some school districts are doing a hybrid where they would um, be able to practice social distancing in their classrooms by having some students um, some days and other students other days, and then doing right. virtual the rest of the week. But we were just doing all, all in the classroom or all virtual. And then we also had this third option, this remote learning option where we wanted to prepare our teachers in case we ended up not opening the schools because um, of the number of cases of coronavirus that we have in our county. And right now we are at a level three in Butler County. Mm. And I heard we're close to level four. Um, so that remote option might be uh, something that we end up relying on when schools open. Um, I'm not sure yet if that's where we're going, but we wanted to make sure that we have as much flexibility as possible um, we're also looking at safety in the classroom by having like uh, plexiglass um, barriers for teachers. So when you're in a group, um, the teacher has some kind of um, safety masks. Um, we have those shields, um, lots of cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, you know, anything we can think of to do. Because like I said, we didn't know what the governor was going to say. So we're looking at taking all the precautions that we can. Sure. So you're basically going off your health department um, rules rather than, because the state hasn't really, they've kind of passed it down to the local level, right? Yeah, thanks for acknowledging that. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what's happening. And I don't think that that's right. I think that um, there's been a lack of leadership in the federal government and guidance on what we need to be doing. Uh, there's a lack of leadership in the state on what we need to be doing and how we need to be proceeding. And it just seems like they're passing the buck to local school boards. And we don't have nearly the quality of information that they would have at the federal or state level, um, but we're doing the best that we can with what we have. And we are working very closely with our local public health officials, um, both in our city and countywide. And a lot of our school districts are um, having regular meetings. Our superintendents are meeting regularly sharing plans, sharing ideas. 
And then um, I, I'm sure our superintendent is daily talking to our health director. Yeah, sure. Now, how do your teachers feel about um, the reopening? I, I guess there's probably a mixed um, opinion from them. Oh, do they feel safe? Um, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of concerns. I don't think a lot of parents feel safe sending their kids. Um, I just, I don't know how anybody could. Right. Yeah, it's, um, it's tough. I mean, you know, this is a once in a lifetime situation, right? It's not like this has happened before. And um, I know a lot of parents that I see um, talking online in our community uh, want their children to go back for the socialization side of things. And I, I understand that, um, but it doesn't seem like the experience is going to be what children are used to um, when it comes to that, because they're not going to be able to, you know, gather in their groups. They're not going to be able to sit with their friends at lunchtime. Um, recess is going to be completely different. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a tough situation all around. I, I think in theory, everything sounds good, but when we really look at what it's gonna look like, it just, it's gonna be so difficult. And, um, you know, it's hard to anticipate everything, but like you're saying with that socialization, um, I agree, it, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be the same. We're not going back to how things were, used to be. Everything's right. gonna look different. Right. Now, if, if they have a full classroom or a close to full classroom, are they going to be able to stay six feet away? I assume they won't. No, not not in Middletown. I mean, we weren't we weren't really able to do the social distancing. We we're already having space issues in our schools um, prior to COVID nineteen and having social distancing, um, right. where we were getting modular units um, for our middle school because we were using library spaces as classroom spaces. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Beaver Creek is in my district as well, obviously. Um, and I spoke with a teacher from there who said that even last year, he's a science teacher in high school and he had something like 34 kids in his 26 desk room. And, you know, they had kids doubling up um, at a single desk. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting when we do our building projects and if you have to partner with the state on your building project, um, they won't let you forecast future um, enrollments. They make you go with um, current enrollment for those building projects and projections. So by the time the project is built, your school district is usually already too small. Right, right. Yeah, well, you know, all the schools in my district have put out plans. Bellbrooks is still kind of, you know, they're about to launch it, but, you know, there's, there's only so many options you can go with, right? I mean, there's the pretty much the same as what you mentioned, the 100% the remote. Um, they talked about a third party vendor if um, they have this mixed bag where teachers have to teach in the classroom and the kids that stay at home go with a third party vendor. But we also heard that was $3,000 per student per year. And you know, obviously with the uh, budgetary concerns that we are dealing with, I don't know how that's a, a possibility um, either, but um, yeah. All right. Um, I, I just don't know if there's a way to safely reopen. And, and we need to think about this. I mean, we are talking about people's lives. We're talking about, you know, we, we don't know so much about this virus and potentially exposing our children, our students, our teachers to it. I mean, we really have to take this seriously. We're not just, I mean, it's not just numbers that we're talking about here. It's people. Right. Exactly. And nobody wants to have their child be the one who gets sick. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of talk also about the fact that children don't catch it or transmit it as much as adults do. But, um, you know, I'm sure there may be some truth to that. But at the same time, you know, our children have been out of school since March. I mean, my children literally have not seen other children um, for a few months now. So we don't know what will happen when we put them all back together like that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a huge risk. Um, our school is, is starting off in a hybrid way for the first three weeks, kind of like the first part of the alphabet comes one day or goes two days, the other half comes another day. 
but that's only happening for three weeks. And then after that, we're supposed to go back to 100%. So I'm not even sure what benefit that gives. I mean, other than, you know, I guess a little trial run on how to keep everyone separate, how to, you know, implement all the protocol. But, you know, once you've got 100%, well, I guess it won't be 100% because there's, there are some parents who won't send their kids back. Um, yeah. But Do you have a virtual option too? Um, there is a virtual option, but at this point they're going with the hybrid. Um, we, we can stay at home and work. Yes, but that's where they want to kind of bring in that third party. It, it hasn't been decided. So we, we wouldn't get Bellbrook teachers necessarily. So, you know, that's not something I'm overly excited about, but you know, yeah. it's, you have to be adaptable and we have to protect everyone that's involved here. So I would say if our numbers were lower, like a lot of these ideas, they're really great ideas. They're going to keep people safer. Um, they're going to work if our numbers are lower in our counties. I'm not sure if we're there right now where it's going to, it's going to be safe for people because I think our numbers are still really high and it, it probably depends on where you are in the state too. Right. And we're a month away from this opening too. Uh, anything could happen in that time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, it's so just I keep telling people just keep wearing your mask, social distance, don't go out unless you have to. Let's get our kids back into school. Let's get them back into sports and let's make it safe for them. Yeah, agreed. All right. Well, thank you, Michelle. We've kind of run out of time here, but it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And um, it sounds like the two of us would be pretty valuable in our state house in November or should I say January of 21. Yeah, so, sounds that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyone who's watching this who's from Butler County, I thought, does your area extend beyond Butler County or it's just? No, it's, um, it's about half of the county. It's oh. Middletown, Monroe, Trenton, um, a little bit of Hamilton and Oxford, and okay. then a lot of the rural townships in between. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So if anyone has friends or family in that area, let them know about Michelle. And um, let's get some people in Columbus because as you can tell by this conversation, a lot of the problems stem from there. And we can't have a solid educational program going if we don't have the support in the state house that we need because they are the drivers of education. They have a constitutional duty to provide these schools um, across our state and they have failed us over the last 20 to 30 years and it's time for a change. So best of luck, Michelle. I'll see you on the campaign trail out there, at least virtually, I'm sure, at some point. But thank yep. you so much for coming. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Good luck to All you, right. too. All thank right. You. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. All right. That's us. Um, that's it from us today. Next week, I'm going to have a Bath Township trustee on to talk about the Renergy biodigester that's causing so much anguish for so many people in the Fairborn and Bath Township area. So I invite you to come next week to um, listen to that conversation to see what you can do to help um, so many citizens that live here in District 73. All right, signing off. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good day.